Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. And our top story today, higher ed lessons from Peloton. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Dr. Joshua Kim. He's Director of Online Programs and Strategy at the Dartmouth Center for the Advancement of Learning. Josh, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Jeffrey, great to be here with you. Yeah, it's great to talk higher education, college. And look, we have just come out of, we think we've come out of, we don't want to, fingers crossed, come out of the pandemic. But there's been a great shift in the world of higher education. You wrote a great blog piece about how higher ed should look a little bit more like Peloton. But before we get into the rationale there, let's just talk about where does higher education stand as you and I are talking today? Great. Well, looking forward to speaking. I'm not sure that higher education should look exactly like Peloton, but we, we can um, we can get into this. So I think the big question we all have now is, what are things going to look like after the pandemic? Um, what have we learned? What can we take forward? And what can we do differently um, now that the pandemic is hopefully ending? Yeah. And, and, and so a lot of Kids, uh, if they were going off to school, some of them maybe even delayed school um, because they wanted to be on campus. And I, I know you were right in the middle of it. I mean, kids uh, taking classes online if they couldn't be on campus. I mean, it really, really varied depending on what state, what locality they lived in. Um, but I have to think that we've learned a lot from these online tools. And I, I didn't mean to apply that higher education needs to look like Peloton, I guess, there are some lessons there. Um, if people are using a Peloton bike or a Peloton treadmill, there's some lessons there. What are some of those lessons? Sure, great. And and I experienced this also as a dad, as a parent. Um, I had my daughters come home and live at home and try to fi uh, finish out their senior year and start graduate school during the pandemic. And it wasn't great, right? Like it was, it was a hard situation for for everyone. And one of the things that we learned during this pandemic is how important that residential experience is, how much we all want to be and need to be together on our campuses. So I think some of our lessons are, well, how can we keep that core residential experience, but also bring some of the affordances of digital technology so that we can be resilient, say, if another variant spikes or we have extreme weather events, um, and also how we can improve online education for those people not like my kids, not like my daughters, who are working full time, who have jobs and families who really can't quit their jobs and can't move and be on campus for to get their master's degree, say, and want to keep um, working and studying at the same time. Yeah, re really good point. And, and there's a lot to the college experience beyond just going to class. I think you you really refer to this. I mean, it's about going to clubs, going to sports events, uh, hanging out with friends, maybe going to the local watering hole if you're of age, of course. We don't, you know, hint, hint. Uh, but, but you're right. I mean, supplementing that engaging education where you're meeting with professors, you're working in groups with computer-based, we used to call it CBT, computer-based uh, programming, uh, really can help augment that education and 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 re and redefine and also help you refine what you're learning. Yep. Yeah, I think that brings us to some of the lessons of, about Peloton, which I think are, are interesting lessons. And it's important to separate the story of Peloton from, from the bikes that so many of my friends and colleagues love and have a great time and the company. Yeah. And what I was really writing about is the challenges that Peloton as a company has had in their business model and their stock price that went way high during the midst of, of the pandemic and have really crashed down as people have started to come back. I think the big lesson here is that like with Peloton, the, the biking at home is only going to have a part of people's fitness. People still want to 
go to gyms. It's not going to replace, Peloton will never replace the experience of, of going to gyms. And I think Peloton and the investors thought, well, this is what ha would happen. It would just keep growing and keep growing. I think some of the lessons here for, for online and remote education is it will complement residential and face-to-face -face education. There is room for both and we need to have both for the reasons that you talked about. You really can't replace so much of what you get on campus in a face-to-face in a -face residential campus environment with online learning. Yeah, no, you can't. You can. I mean, I think, I, I, and look, I, I know people who have, are taking classes online. You know, you had the chat rooms, you have the Zoom meetings like we're doing right now. You get some interaction, but really there's a lot that you pick up. I, and, and we see this, by the way, with big, the business meetings too. There's a lot you pick up from the, the nonverbal communication from the professor, from the group meetings. And that really can't be replicated uh, very well, in, at least today with the technology we have. But what, what are some of the challenges and you're director of online programs. I mean, what are some of the challenges with, with programming around in-class or out-of-class instruction? Yeah, I, th I think like with every technology, we have to use it appropriately and think of our goals for using technology. So if you're fortunate enough, like, like I was fortunate enough as a dad to send my kids to a residential education that they have that experience in that 18 to 22, that's wonderful. That's the minority of all learners. You know, fewer than one in five um, undergraduates actually have that residential on-campus experience. Most of our learners in this country are adult learners, they're working, they have families, they don't have the luxury of the residential experience. So what we need to do is say, okay, that residential experience is wonderful. We need to keep that, we need to augment that, we need to invest in that. At the same time, we have to improve the online experience for those learners where that works best where online works best with their families and their work. We're going to see rapid, rapid growth in master's degrees, in particular as master's degrees are the new undergraduate in low residency, hybrid and online learning. And I think we've learned a great deal during the pandemic of how to do that sort of learning better. Yeah, uh, Josh, I need to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the evolution. I'm going to call it less Peloton and more the evolution of online lo 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 learning programs and how they can be symbiotic with in-class instruction. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. 
This free book reveals little-known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book, and as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free, for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-504-8194. Welcome back. We're talking this morning to Dr. Joshua Kim. He is with the Dartmouth Center for the Advancement of Learning. Josh, thanks so much for sticking with us this morning. Great conversation, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, we, and again, you know, we only have 20, 25 minutes. We never do these topics justice, but I think we give a lot of people um, information they can kind of percolate. And they can certainly check out your blog on Inside Higher Ed where you wrote about this topic. You know, I want to ask you, Josh, uh, if about tuition. And we have a lot of kids out there, a lot of adults out there with this $1.6 trillion, give or take, depending on who you talk to, in student loan debt. Do you need not you, but does there need to be an adjustment? Say I attend class uh, online. Does there need to be adjustment if I'm not getting that full in-person experience to the tuition that I'm paying? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're talking about tuition. And again, as a parent, having um, had to pay for my two daughters, that was the most expensive thing that we had to do. We spent more money educating our kids than we did on our house. Um, and that's, that's crazy, right? It is it is nuts how high tuition has gotten. Um, it is a terrible thing that our graduates are being burdened by the student debt. I mean, can you imagine graduate today and you not only have to deal with high housing prices, but high levels of, of student debt. Students come out with something like an average of undergraduates, $30,000, $35,000 in debt. Yeah. That's, that's terrible. So what I think we have to do is we have to think, well, how can we utilize new methods, new technologies to lower the cost while increasing quality? Now, we have to be careful that, that we can't say, well, online education should be cheaper, right? Doing high quality online education is really expensive. And if you go to a, a really good school and, and get a, a really good online degree, a ton of resources are invested in that degree. So I think the, the real issue is not like we say, is should online education be less expensive? All education needs to be less expensive. We all need to tackle the student debt crisis together. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and you know, you, you get what you pay for. So if you want bare bones, you're gonna get bare bones. And you're right, there has to be a lot of resources, tools, uh, tactics, and things that are available to the student to reinforce what he or she, they are learning in the classroom. Let me ask you about the mechanics behind it, because again, you and I are talking on Zoom. Is the technology available today to really have a great online experience? And what I mean by that is, you know, zooming in on the professor or professors in a class, being able to record digitizing the materials, being able to see things in a way that is easy for the student to digest the information and also to, you know, to be able to take the information and move forward in their advancement of their degree. Yep. Great question. You know, I think when we talk about costs and technology, we, we have to talk about the roots of why the debt crisis is occurring for our students. And we have to remember that over eight in 10 students go to public institutions. And over the past 20 years, we've seen state governments dramatically cut back on their uh, investments in public higher education. So what's happened is that, that students and their families have had to take in that, that up. So we've shifted the burden from public to private and that is driven, driven debt and, and that, that is really the challenge. Can we use technologies to try to lower the cost of education? Sure. I, th I think we're, we're at a point now where we can start to scale um, some online education programs. But what you never want to do is you never want to replace the relationship that a learner has with their professor, a learner and an educator. That's the core of a quality education. And, and that, that's going to be expensive. So I think we should not look for technology for magic bullets. We should really be thinking about the funding system of our system of higher education and invest in public institutions, invest in our community colleges. I think that's where the conversation needs to go. Yeah, you, you bring up community colleges. They are a great opportunity. You talk about balancing debt versus uh, you know, what you're getting. 
if you know, look, I remember years and years ago when I was a, a, a undergraduate, and I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so those first couple of years, you know, some people are blessed. They want to be doctors, attorneys. They want to go into sports management, whatever. I wasn't blessed with that. So there's a lot of kind of finding yourself. And those, those, aren't, those community colleges are a great stepping stone to figuring that out, getting some basic core competency, and then going to a four-year school like a Dartmouth or another school to really focus, hone in on what they want to focus on. Yeah, I agree. I mean, community colleges are where it's at. They serve the plurality of all undergraduate learners. They are where opportunity is created. And it's absolutely scandalous in this country how we've underinvested in this, this resource of community colleges that are so important. We know that the jobs that people will have, they will need more education. That's, that's clear. This is where we should be investing. Yeah. Uh, Josh, when you look out five 10 years now, and I know, you know you've got to have your one-year business plan, you've got to have your five-year, your 10-year. What, you, what do you see are, as the future of uh, education? That's really a broad question, but where do you see this all headed? You talked a lot about cost, you talked about technology, uh, but where, where if, if ki- parents are out there, they've got kids in junior high school, what should they, or maybe even elementary school, because they talk, or kindergarten, what, what should they be focused on if they're thinking about sending their kid off to a, uh, a college, a four-year school or a two-year school five, 10 years from now? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I do have to say, you know, for your audience, you know, thank you for all those grandparents out there who are helping to support their kids through, through their grandkids through, through a college. It's the, the best investment you can make. I mean, I think higher education will go in the way of many other industries. I mean, we've seen transformations in the news industry and in film where the, the consumer is becoming a, a lot more important, where we have a shift from um, an emphasis on the producer to the consumer as there's more choice, as there's more options, as digital technology allows more choice. So I think over time, I'm positive about the future of colleges and universities. I think we'll become more learner centric. I think we'll become more flexible. And I do think there's a big movement to try to drive down the costs for our learners. Yeah. It's really hard to change, right? I mean, I grew up in the financial services industry, the retirement industry. Uh, There's incremental change that happens over 30, 40 years. Look, we had pension plans. Now we have 401k or 403b plans. That has been incremental. It seems like the same thing has to happen in higher education. It's very incremental, but you don't want to lose sight of some of this cool technology. Streaming, for example. I mean, you look, everyone's watching Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, right? I mean, there's so much technology out there that can be adapted. And you think about how that applies to learning. I, I mean, you must, must be licking your chops as the director of you know, uh, online programs at Dartmouth. I think it's an exciting time. I mean, Jeffrey, think about when you and I were in in college and think about how we sat in the back of these big lecture halls. Higher education is so much better now than it was when we were in college. We understand so much more about learning science. We have all these digital technologies and we're applying it all. Higher education is changing very rapidly. What we do have to focus on, as I think you talked about, is I think we have to be more accessible. I think we have to drive down our costs. Um, Overall, in this country, the the, uh, graduation rates, six-year graduation rates, are not great overall. We do a great job of getting students into college and not graduating. We have a lot of work to do. So I'm happy to have this open conversation. Yeah, this is great. Well, Josh, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on the program. And look, we look forward to checking in with you from time to time to see how things are going. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks, Jeffrey. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to see our latest content, search our archives, or check out our website, and also our streaming partners, Amazon, Roku, Samsung, over 100 more. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.
Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.